This is True Crime Kent. Here we are for Mel Gunnis Part 3 on. Part 3. Yes. When we left that broad-shouldered behemoth known as Belle Gunnis in Part 2, she was murdering her way to riches. She was living with her remaining children on a huge farm and reaping the benefits of reaping, I guess. She had, however, unfortunately for her, accidentally put a bloodhound by the name of Azel, Azel, Isle, Azel, Helgelian on her trail because he was now out looking for his missing brother. Furthermore, kicking her fucking farm hand, I mean like the farm hand that she was fucking, not like the fucking farm hand, actually, I guess I do because he was also doing fucking. He was the fucking. He was the fucking farm hand, but not a fucking farm hand. He was, yeah, fucking her. Anyways, she had just jilted her pig shit smelling lover and kicked him from the house. Uh, it's crazy because one of the, it seems like one like there's people like this. And they're always kind of blow my mind where they they understand other people's weaknesses so well that they play them like a fiddle like she she knew she yeah. knew all of this dude's weaknesses not to mention which was mostly weaknesses mostly weakness yes yeah. <laughs> mostly weaknesses and uh, and she knew how to leverage what she needed out of it like that's that's a skill i mean that's like a you know if she was alive today and decided not to kill a bunch of people that's like a CEO skill. It's like, how do I collect people? How do I realize what I need from them? How do I identify their weaknesses so I can make them feel like I am benevolent and then, but also. Or I can use them as a stepping stone. Yes. Step. It's diabolical, but also yes. genius. Yeah, today she just live in Silicon Valley. And the other thing is she was. And have an OnlyFans. She was fugly. I mean, like. That's there's a market. I guess so. I guess so. <clears throat> there is. There's got to be a market for women in like football pads. Q by four woman who wants to you to bring her all of your money. Like you deserve. I'm sorry. Maybe that's too mean to say. But if you if you pack up all your stuff, take all of your money, opt not to tell anyone where you're going, and then you get killed by the person that told you to do all that. Yeah. I don't feel too sorry for you. <laughs> yeah, I don't like the victim blame. So I'm just going to say that this is 100% the victim's fault. Yeah, that's like... For sure, this is their fault. Uh, there's red flags left and right here. Bell Gunnis certainly shouldn't have been murdering innocent men. Totally. But, but that's like... Hey, don't tell anybody where you're going, please. Make sure you get all of your money. Don't leave a trail. And be here at, at dusk. It's like it's like it's like being on a boat on the ocean and finding a little floating sign that says "Great White Shark Petting Zoo" below. Jump in, yeah. and you're like, "Oh, well, it must be official." I mean, when you buy the food, it's just a razor that comes out. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> Byoc, it's running a little bring, ways down your forearm. Bring your own chum. <laughs> My point about all this is Bell Gunness' house of cards is getting ready to fall up. It's all getting ready to come crashing down. And by mid-March of 1908, Azel then writes to Bell Gunness asking where his brother Andrew is. Hey, I know he came to your place. Where is he? And March 27th, Bell responds and tells Azel that, well, I'd like to know that as well. He's He's certainly not in several pieces in my backyard that we could be sure of. That is, we shouldn't even look because he is not in many, many pieces in my backyard. Hmm. So I don't know is that much we can be sure of, though. <laughs> He's not in my backyard in lime. He's not covered in lime in my backyard. Four foot down 
in the hog pen. That's not where he is. March 27th. I'm sorry. According to Belle in the letter, she tells Andrew that he had actually originally left their house, their home there, to search for one of his brothers that had a gambling problem. And according to her, her home there in Laporte was just a stop for him on his way through Indiana. He never had any intention of staying there. She was just a a pit stop, a booty call, a, a uh, just a, you know, uh, when I come through looking for a girl like you, yeah, yeah. What just yeah, happened? Yeah, yeah. Did you have a stroke or is that a song? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a song by Adam Shitstain Devine, who I liked for a long time. And then it turned out he was a piece of shit as well, like all the other fucking phonies in Hollywood cheating on his wife. It's got all the phonies of Hollywood in one music video. It's actually impressive. If you watch the video, they just shape shift into what we now know of every piece of shit in Hollywood wearing their Virtue Signal shirt. So it's actually a really impressive music video. You got Ellen DeGeneres there. And, you know, she's now obviously a piece of shit. All of them pieces of shit. Anyways, <laughs> that's directly related to this story. Don't you feel upset about the fact that, like, when you were a kid and you were singing a song and now you look back and you're like, man, I had no idea what that meant. It'd be funny if that just stopped happening when we were kids. But to this day, I still do it. Here's an excerpt from that letter that Bell wrote to Azel about his the location of his brother. <clears throat> Here we go. This is Bell Gunnis writing back. Okay. Okay. The action. Did you hear my throat make that fart noise? Yeah, it was fun. <laughs> action. Okay. <clears throat> he was going to make a thorough search for him in Chicago and New York. And, of course, by the way, she's talking about, hey, he's just looking for your all's alcoholic gambling brother. Okay. okay. She's explaining. He was going to make a... Yes. He was going to make a thorough search for him in Chicago and New York. He always thought that he had gone to Norway and he would go after him there. He sent me a letter after getting to Chicago that said he was to look for his brother the next day and that I shouldn't write until I again heard from him. Since then, I have neither heard nor seen anything of him. This is all I could say to you about the matter. I have waited every day to hear something of him since. All we can know for sure is that he's not in several pieces in my backyard, four foot under, covered in lime. That's all we can know for sure. <laughs> Bell Gunners, I've got a huge clip. Go. Oh. She's a liar. A big liar. Huge liar. March 28th, 1908, just one day after writing that letter in response to Azel Helgelidian, Bell goes and files an affidavit that claimed that Ray Lamphere, if you remember, her former farmland worker that was obsessed with, that loved her. Not obsessed, that's not fair for Ray. Just loved her. Just this poor galumph idiot that loved her. She files an affidavit saying that Ray Lamphere is insane. He's crazy. And in it, she accused Ray of being, quote, silent, melancholy, restless, seclusive, dull, profane, filthy, intemperate, sleepless, and criminal. And uh, several of those things are hitting a little close to home. <laughs> so I find this somewhat offensive. <laughs> yeah. Insane. Yeah, if I'm crazy, that means that the government isn't spying on me with bird drones. Right. 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 Yeah, that's funny. Uh, she she actually used the word that died out in there. Do you notice she said seclusive? Yes. It means the same thing as reclusive, but we don't use seclusive anymore, which is funny because it kind of fits better. Seclude to seclude. Nobody says to reclude. So it it, it fits better. Well, also, some of her descriptive words here conflict with the others that she uses. Yeah, yeah, which is... I don't think that somebody that is a restless, profane, filthy, intemperate, sleepless, and criminal could also be described as silent, no. melancholy, and dull. Yeah. I, I feel like this, what she wrote here, was to evoke a uh, feeling of confoundment 
with whoever read it, and they just kind of go, oh, that stack of words makes me feel a certain way. She must be on to something. And isn't it crazy how you could do that in this time period? You could just go and be like, that guy's crazy. And then you just say a bunch of things and like, well, reckon he is. And they throw him in a home. So glad we're beyond that these days. Yeah. She also claimed that Ray would come to her house every night and look through her windows. And this is honestly, this is, that's not fair for, this is just early 1900s flirting and romance. I was going to say, not, not a problem. Yeah, not a problem. Girls still think it's hot in some more backwoods areas of Indiana. Also, she might not be wrong here. Because that probably, like you said, it was probably common. Well, in these backwards parts of Indiana, girls, still today, 2024, they every morning they wake up and they excitedly run outside and check under their window for a puddle. <sighs> and if it's there, that means he likes you. Gross. It's like leaving a flower under your windowsill. It's very sweet. Gross. R- rural romance. It's like the tooth fairy, but the baby batter fairy. (laughs) I like you. Check yes or no in the semen. Yeah, he comes back the next night, checks it. (laughs) I'd like to be disgusted, but I did did include myself in that jocular humor right there. So I apologize. Yes. Jocular, yes. Mm -hmm. Anyways, the three-member insanity commission there ruled that Ray Lamphere was not insane. Which surprised me reading that. I thought I thought it was a way easier to get somebody just thrown in a loony bin during this time period than it actually was, I guess. Because they have a commission. And they said, no, Ray's not crazy. See? Everything. She, she, you know, that old commission was like, yep, no, looking in windows, totally normal. Okay. What else you got? Yeah. Did you check yes or no? Seclusive. Huh? Most of the people out there. Okay. Did you check yes or no? supposed to ride it with a tampon if you did you're complicit bell come on you know you checked yes <sighs> and this really pissed bell off really made her mad that she couldn't get poor ray lamphere hauled off to a loony bin so she takes another approach and in early april of 1908 she has ray lamphere arrested again for trespassing and we're going to get into whether or not this is actually happening in a minute but a week before ray lamphere's trial Bell gets another letter from Azel Helgelian. And in that letter, Azel is saying, Hey, so you're saying that my brother sent you a letter saying that he was going to look for our, our brother with the gambling problem. Why don't you just send me that letter then? Let me read it. Ah, okay. Quick question. I know what I, my brother's handwriting looks like. I know you're going to get to it, but you said Ray Lamphere was arrested again for trespassing. Remind me, where, how how far out did she kick him? Did she kick him off the farm completely, or did she just kick him out of the house? She kicked him initially out of the house so that Andrew Helgelian could move in, told him to live in the barn, and then they had a dispute that we still don't know what the root of the dispute was, and she fired him and kicked him off the property okay, so, a little bit ways later. So he was trespassing on the whole property. Okay. Yes. All right. Well, right. supposedly. Right. Suppos- we'll get more into that in a minute. Okay. Okay. So like I said, Andrew writes Bell. He says, hey, send me that letter. I know what my brother's handwriting looks like. Just send me the letter. Let me read it. That one where he says he's going around uh, looking for our other brother. Let me read it. And to this, Bell responds, of course, with, quote, Well, a man named Lamphia, Ray Lamphia, who worked for me for a while, began to find so many wrong things to talk about until at last they arrested him. They had three doctors examine him and see if he was sane. They found him not crazy enough to put in a hospital, but perfectly sane enough. He is not. He is now out under bonds and is going to have a trial next week. But one thing I am sure of is that in one way or another, he has taken the letter from Andrew that Andrew had sent me. Others have told me that Lamphere was jealous of Andrew, and that does trouble me. Unquote. Very, very so as you can see here, she's starting a setup. Very particular set of th- uh, set of thefts to make all the things yes. he could take. He just takes a letter. She's seeing what she's seeing is that Azel is not the kind of guy that's just going to give this up. 
And so now she's starting an alibi for Ray, for Ray Lamphere. He was jealous. I don't have the letter because Ray stole it. And it turns out Ray had a problem with Andrew. I hope something didn't happen to Andrew. I hope. Do you think Ray did something to Andrew, maybe? <laughs> Hazel? <laughs> Gosh, I hope he's not buried in my backyard under four foot of dirt covered in lime. <laughs> I hope that's not the case. <laughs> Wednesday, April 15th, 1908. Ray Lamphere's trial takes place in the nearby town of Steelwell. Now, Lamphere's attorney, a man by the name of Wirt Warden, Wirt Warden, had requested a change of venue for the trial because everybody around Laporte knew who Ray Lamphere was. Bell Gunnis did take the stand in this trial and was absolutely bombarded by Ray Lamphere's lawyer, Wirt Warden, because of the sudden deaths of her previous husbands as well as the current location of her daughter. This is the first time this has kind of been brought up publicly to Bell Gunnis. And when this happens, it's on the stand in front of witnesses and everybody. I was going to say, is it's kind of the first time that uh, anyone's really pushed back uh, in, in it is. public. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, I'm, I'm curious to see how she processes that because it, it, to to date, it's been very uh, without recourse. Her her she's been no one has disputed it. So she she's just uh, been plowing. Yeah. Just no pushback at all. No. And like I said, this this lawyer, he bombards her like really like, well, you know, it's funny. Your first husband died. That was suspicious. You know, the two insurance claims they like overlapped on the one day that he died. That's odd. Your other husband had a meat grinder fall on his head. That's odd. Well, by the way, your daughter, where is Jenny, your daughter off to California? That's odd. Nobody ever remembers seeing her leave. Now, Bell's lawyer, Ralph Smith, he did try to object at several points, but the judge, a man by the name of Robert C. Kincaid, he let it ride. He's like, this is interesting. <laughs> let's, keep, let's keep listening to this. By the time Bell Gunnis left the witness stand there on trial, she op was fucking shook. Ha! Just shook. Now, Ray Lamphere, however, was found guilty of trespassing and ordered to pay a total of $19.01, which equals today $633. But something more important came from this trial. Between the letters, the relentless bombardment of letters from Azel Helgelian, Andrew's brother, and her time up there on the witness stand, Belle Gunnis has realized that all of her bullshit is catching up with her. Yep. And I'm guessing she doesn't just roll over. Well, I mean, she does. She can't. She physically can't. Yep. April 24th, 1908. Nine days after that trial that left Bell shook, she received another letter from Azel Helgelian that left her shooketh <laughs> even more. In that letter, Azel suggests, hey, why don't I just come to Laporte? I'll start looking for my brother myself. I'm coming to your backyard, Belle. I'm coming to your town. We're not conversing through letters anymore. Through letter, Belle responded and said that she would be happy to assist him, but she didn't think that they would find anything, and she didn't know what they could do to help find him. She was essentially trying to talk him out of coming. The walls are closing in. The walls are closing in on Belle Gunness. And let me tell you something, up. With the shoulders that Belle Gunnis has, they only have to begin moving in a matter of inches before she starts feeling claustrophobic. Because <laughs> of her size. Because of her size. Yeah, it was a size joke. That was a broad-shouldered broad <laughs> joke. Yeah. Oh. Huge clit! <laughs> Gosh. I don't know if you remember that from part two, that thing that I that isn't historically accurate as far as I'm aware. I'd stricken it from my memory. Making, I was making assumptions. Yeah. Around this time, she has Ray Lamphere arrested again for trespassing. However, this time Ray's friend, a man by the name of John Wheatbrook, 
had went to authorities and said Ray was not trespassing on the day that she's saying because he was at my house all day that day. And it's six miles out of town and Ray only gets to places by foot. He walks. He was at my house from sun, from sunrise to sunset. This is without a doubt a lie. And then two other witnesses came forward and said they had seen them at John Wheatbrook's house. So Ray was released. What I'm getting at, Op, is it is highly possible that the entire Ray Lamphere being crazy and stalking her thing was fabricated from day one. Because if she's willing to lie about it once, she's willing to lie about it a lot, right? Right. Not just some of it. It's possible that this poor, stupid bastard was just minding his own business every day, and he's arrested every other day for trespass, and he's like, he's just drinking a beer on the street by the shoe shiner. And the cops walk up, and he's like, trespassing? Yeah, yeah, I fig here. I figured. Nobody's going to believe me. Saturday, April 25th, 1908, Bell shows up at the Chicago Leader Dry Goods store on Main Street there in Laporte. Bertha Schultz, the clerk that was working there that day at Chicago Leader Dry Goods, spoke with Bell and noted that Bell looked very stressed and out of whack. She's usually very well kept, but this day she 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 was in a hurry, not looking good and seeming very stressed. When asked about it, Bell claimed that the reason she was so stressed was because Ray Lamphere was crazy and that was she was afraid that he would murder her and her children and then burn their house down. And that's oddly specific. Yeah. Oddly specific. I just fear that that crazy guy that I believe is capable of murder would kill me, cut my head off, and then kill my children and burn my house down on April 28th at 4 in the morning. And if that happens, don't come looking for me because I am dead and Ray Lamphere did it. And Andrew Helgian is not in my backyard, full foot under dirt, several pieces covered in lime. And don't even bring it up. <laughs> the clerk's like, I don't know who Andrew Helgian is. Just said that you've got some hair out of whack there. <laughs> April 28th, 4 in the morning. I hope our house doesn't burn down. Ray Lampia. <laughs> he did it. Did you know he had a problem with Andrew? He stole letters. Tell that to the cops when they start asking around. He stole letters. April 28th, 4 in the morning. Ray Lamphere's going to come by my house down and kill me and my children. <laughs> Anyways, I'll have a bag of rice. <laughs> That's what I was waiting for. Is that as she spin out of her awkward explanation? <laughs> My, the price of rice have gone up. <laughs> Jesus. So how are you, Bertha? <laughs> On Monday, April 27th, 1908, Miss Jenny Garwood, who was the teacher of Bell's remaining two children, or remaining two daughters, I'm sorry, 11-year-old Myrtle and 9-year-old Lucy, their teacher is surprised when the two kids come into the Quaker school there crying, and their faces were red, and it seemed if they had been crying for some time. When their teacher asked them what happened, one of the little girls told her they had been playing around the cellar at home. When, in the midst of their play, they decided to go down into the cellar and play a bit. But halfway down the steps, Belle had grabbed them by their hair and the back of their necks and dragged them up and then absolutely just really beating the shit out of them. She told them while she was beating them, quote, You keep out of there! Don't you poke your faces where they are not wanted! Unquote. What do you think was down there? Birthday presents? Yeah, I was going to say. Just snacks. Probably snacks. That's where she kept them. Yeah, they were snacks to begin with. <laughs> That's what she looked at them as. I meant fucking. Doing fucks. Yeah. 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 The same day, this is the same day the kids show up crying. I also need to point out, Op, this is the day before the house burns down at four in the morning. Oh. The same day Belle goes into town in her horse and buggy. Make sure she's seen around town. Her first stop was at the office of her lawyer. Her lawyer's name was Mel Melvin E. Lee Leader. She tells Melvin, hey, I'm afraid for my life. 
And Ray Lamphia is threatening to burn my house down. I hope my house doesn't burn down tonight. <laughs> you seen the price of rice, Melvin? It's through the fucking roof. <laughs> she also fills out her last will and testament. And leaves everything she owns to her three living children in the event of her death. And in the event of their deaths, she leaves everything she owns to the Norwegian Children's Home of Chicago. Interesting about this, uh, knowing what we know now. She doesn't leave anything to Jenny, her child, that's in California. Yeah, right? Interesting. Hmm. Nothing. Nothing. That's because she's dead. They weren't dead. estranged. She's dead. That's why. Yes. Do you remember back when she killed her when you ex- were talking about I do about remember that. that like it was yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> Next, she stops by the state bank and puts $730 in a safety deposit box. That, equal, that equates $24,000 today. Keep in mind, while all this, she's probably still, while all this is going on, got John's rolling up to the door and taking their money. Here's what, here's a thought I just had was this is if somebody in the future did an episode on me and they were talking about things that I did in the day, like what I deposited into the bank account and stuff like all, all these episodes we do, it's like, and then he deposited $630, which is the equivalent of 57,900 a day. When they do the episode about me and like my financial transactions, they'll be, like, and then he deposited $8, which is the equivalent. <laughs> like these people are, all these people in these episodes just rolling in cash. I never. Well, that's the only people she was fishing for. Yeah. I'm just saying, there's no part she in She literally my life. went through a screening process to see if you were rich enough to be worthy of being in her presence, if you remember, through the letters. Yeah. Just my capitalist bone in me is like, oh, man, I don't, I don't have a thing like that. The closest they'll, they'll get is, like, he asked for five bucks from everybody. <laughs> yeah. What makes me sad is as if, as if I'm ever the study of a case in true crime a hundred years from now, and they're like, and then he had this amount of money. I know that the podcaster is going to be like, which equates to three dollars today. <laughs> I think whenever they talk about your amount of money, that but they're also going to bolt on. But he also had a piece of Apollo thirteen. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> other people were investing in stocks and bonds. Wall Street, property, <laughs> not me. If there's one thing that holds its value, it's a piece of a spaceship. <laughs> oh, man. After leaving the bank, Bell stops by the store, just a regular general store, and there she buys candy, cake, and a toy train. Yum. And when the clerk, Marie Farnheim, there at that general store, asks Bell... What's the deal with all this candy cake and, and this toy train? Somebody having a birthday party? Belle responds that she just wanted to give the kids a little treat. Uh-huh. This is a going away forever present. This ain't a little treat. Yeah. Her last stop was at another general store called John Minick's General Store. And there she bought groceries. And as clerk George Wace recalled... Two gallons of kerosene in a five-gallon can. Did you say John Minick's General Store? Yes. I remember there was a commercial for John Minick's General Store. Come to Pathmark 24 hours a day for savings all that's over not, that add up to savings overall. That is not. That's Pathmark. I don't know. Pathmark. Thank you. I think he said John Minick's. Let's play it again. Let's hear it. Come to Pathmark 24 hours a day for savings all over yeah. that add up to savings uh, overall. John Minick. Yeah. Right there at the I end. I heard it too the second time. Yeah. Subtle. Yeah. Two gallons of kerosene up. Suspicious. After running her errands, she arrives home at 5.30 p.m. And her new farm helper, if you remember, we talked about her hiring him after firing uh, Ray Lamphere, a young man by the name of Joe Maxson. Her new farmhand helps her unload everything from her from her horse carriage. And she instructs Joe Maxson, put that kerosene in the entryway under the back stairs of the house. 
Yes, yes, Joe. Somewhere easily accessible in the next few hours. Don't bother putting it out in the shed in case I need it here in the house tonight at 4 a.m. She's so subtle. 6.30 p.m. that evening. Joe Maxson sits down with Belle and her three kids for supper. For whatever reason, Op, on this night, Belle really went all out with supper. He said it was like a huge spread. They had bread and butter, dried beef, salmon, beef steak, potatoes, cookie and jams. Did you say cookies salmon? And jams, salmon. Yep. That reminds me of the 2021 Native American Jamal Creek, Oregon Chinook. I don't know why it would. One ounce point nine 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 silver, one dollar proof right. coin. And this right. is what's interesting about that. Between 2020 and 2022, right. we, we have a whole series there for a yeah. of silver dollar proof coins, and each one represents mm-hmm. a different Native American tribe. And you can, right. this is, I'm sure everybody knew this already because they probably have them all, but you can collect all of yeah. them. And they're actually worth more than, they're more, <laughs> worth more than a dollar. They're like, you know, right now, like the 2021 Native American Jamal Creek Oregon Chinook salmon coin is worth around $67. Oh, wow. You probably knew that. $67. Figured you knew. I don't know why I Almost say Almost a full that, tank of gas. Yeah. Wouldn't that be fun? You just go and hand it to the gas station. Kia. They're like, this is a $1 proof coin for the Jamal Creek, Oregon right. Chinook. And you're like, right. it's worth 67 and then they just let you go because they understand. Look, my point is. Okay, I won't. Unless c- completely compelled, oh, I will not interrupt you hell. again about coins. What's that? Unless completely compelled by something very relevant, I promise to not interrupt you about coins again in this episode. My point here is she made a huge meal and it's almost like a last supper. Would you agree? Yeah, like, that's a big that's it's a big very meal. fortunate that she chose to really go all out with this meal on this not knowing what we know now what happens. It was just timing is crazy. I just find it suspicious that when it comes to money, you always do an equivalent thing like that's equivalent to today. But when you list off the meal, you don't give what that's equivalent to today. All right. Well, let's see here. Bread and butter. Uh, Let's say we'll say garlic knots today. Okay. Dried beef. Uh, I don't know. I don't. What's what's an equivalent to dried beef today? Obviously, beef jerky. Yeah. But like, you wouldn't have that at dinner. No, uh, dried beef would be like Nancy. Pl- no, we need to eat f- food related. What were you getting ready to say there? Nothing. Um, dried okay. beef, probably Arby's meat. Arby's meat. Yeah. Yeah, okay. like maybe roast beef. Yeah. God, I love roast beef. I could take I could get an Arby sandwich and just eat handfuls of the roast beef without the bread. Yeah. That's how good Arby's roast beef is. I love salmon. It. I would say the equivalent to salmon today is probably something along the lines of like salmon. Yeah. It's probably beef steak. We still have be- beef steak, potatoes. Beef, beef steak, potatoes. Bo- both of those are equivalent to the same. And cookies and jam. Yeah. Same. Those are probably equivalent today to cookies and jam. See, but now people can wrap their head around the meal you were talking about. I'd recommend. Right. So really the only thing that was confusing about that whole meal was dried beef. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm glad we cleared it up. Me too. Thanks, man. You're welcome. That's what I'm here for. And if you really enjoy the idea of me just talking by myself... You can hop on to Patreon or 1159plus.com where we do TCK case files, which is TCK episodes that are only there where I do the show by myself. Crazy. And and there's no, that's not relevant to anything we were talking about prior. It's just a fact. I just wanted to offer it up that I know things might get a little stale with just you on there. So if you need me to record little like snippets or clips. All right. I'll contact Jack Lennon. <laughs> He's good at it. He's good. Do that. <laughs> Just Sam at 1159 if you sorry. need to ask me. Anything. After they have this huge dinner, 
the five of them, now the five were saying Belle, her her farm hand there, Joe Maxson, and, and then the three children, Lucy Myrtle and little Philip, four year old Philip. They all go to the parlor and they play a bunch of games and they never did this before. And they eat cakes and 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 they get to open the toys that Belle had got on that day. They played games like Little Red Riding Hood and the Fox. Little and Red I did Riding try to Hood. Look up what Fairy Tales, Fables, three ounce silver coin, twenty dollars from the Cook Islands, which is recognized by New Zealand as an actual coin. Sorry, I just told you if it was relevant, I would, I, I might mention it. The, this three ounce silver coin is the first release in the Fairy Tales in Fables series from the Cook Islands. This one was dedicated to some of the most famous fairy tales in it. In in this case, it was Little Red Riding Hood. But, I mean, I had to mention it because nobody would ever think that somebody did a Little Red Riding coin, but they did in the Cook Islands, which was recognized as a denomination for New Zealand. Ah, I said I wouldn't do it. I think I used up all my coins on this episode. Is what I, I like talking coins. I think I used them all up. So I'm just going to sit here and pretend we're on a TCK case files <laughs> from now on. I tried a different approach there. I was going to let you s- just swing until you were tired. Yeah. I became self-aware too quick, though. <laughs> like artificial intelligence. Look, I just, I just, I tried to figure out what is Little Red Riding Hood and the Fox. Maybe it's a board game. I don't know. It's a coin. I didn't come up with anything that described how one would play Little Red Riding Hood and the Fox. Yeah. But the point is, they eat this huge meal, they go to the parlor, and then they all play games and eat snacks. They never do this because Belle Gunness isn't a good mother. She's a piece of shit. So it's just odd, the timing on all this. You know, all of this is odd considering what's getting ready to happen here in a few hours. At 8.30 p.m., Joe Maxson, the farmhand, says, I'm ready for bed. He heads upstairs. Later, he'll quote that the last thing he saw when he looked back before he headed up the stairs. Quote, The last I saw of Miss Gunnis, she was sitting on the floor with her daughters and son playing with the toy engine and passenger coaches. Unquote. Joe Maxson goes to bed. I don't know what the train has to do with Little Red Riding Hood. They were just having a little party there that night. A little party. Yeah. It's nice. Just having fun. One good hoorah. Maybe Bell's misunderstood. Maybe. At 4 a.m. in the early morning of April 28th, 1908 up, Joe Maxson, the farmhand that's sleeping on the second floor, Wakes up to smoke in his room. As you do. What? What the heck? Now, he said originally (laughs) he thought that Belle was just already up making breakfast, which is really kind of a testament to probably how bad of a cook she was, considering what's burning is the house. (laughs) And I'll tell you this, a, um, a campfire doesn't smell anything like eggs and bacon. Mmm, shiplap. So he wakes up to smoke in his room. He hops out of bed in his long johns, opens the window, and sticks his head outside and looks down. And this is when he notices that the house below him is completely engulfed in flames. Joe yanks on his boots, doesn't tie them, and then starts screaming, Fire! Trying to wake everybody else up in the house. He grabs a small satchel, and a handful of personal belongings and runs down the rear stairs and out the out into the backyard. Joe kind of a will be kind of a hero in this situation or tries to be. Seems like a like a good dude. Drops his stuff off at the carriage shed about 50 feet away and then tries to make his way back into the house to get the kids that he knew were on the second floor. Unfortunately, by the time he got back to the house, the flames had already completely overtaken the downstairs and he couldn't get back into the burning house through the back door that he had just came out of. So he runs to the shed and gets an axe and then runs to the front door and stops, starts trying to chop down the front door because it had been locked. However, after a few whacks into the front door, Joe begins to hear a cracking noise. 
And that's when he looks up and sees the roof on the top story cave in. While this is happening, not far away, Gunnis' neighbor, Ella Clifford, has just woken up to get breakfast ready for her husband, Michael Clifford. He had to leave for work before daybreak. She gets up before daylight, starts making him breakfast. But while preparing breakfast there at the stove, she looks out her kitchen window and sees that Belle's house is completely engulfed in flames. That's when she yells and wakes up her teenage son, William, and tells him, hey, get on your bike and get over there and make sure they're awake and out of the house, for God's sakes. So little William Clifford, teenage William Clifford, hops on his bike, pedals as fast as he could to the Gunnis farm. And just as he gets there, that's when Joe Maxson is chopping down the front door with the axe. Seconds later, he also saw the roof collapse. Meanwhile, while William Clifford and Joe Maxson are watching the house start to cave in, Ella Clifford, who has just sent her son to go wake up the Gunnises, is shaking her husband Michael awake, as well as her brother-in-law, Michael's brother, William Humphrey. And I got to say at this part, you know, Michael had to be at work later that morning. And I remember working, waking up when I was in the machine shop, working at the machine shop. And if I got upset, if I woke up a few minutes before the alarm went off, like if I had to be up at yeah. five, right? In the alarm, right. And I woke up at, at say, 444. Ooh, I was in a bad mood the rest of the day. Me too. Just imagine being woke up a few minutes early to go put out a house fire and save a family before work. Uh, it's it's Just that the, drive to work, that angry drive. The closest I experience is the, I don't know if you've, you have this one, but the 3 a.m. Barf machine that one of your kids becomes, and they don't just like barf yeah. in one quaint little spot. It's like, Dad, I threw up on the entire inside of the That's house. That's not what they say. They say, Daddy, I, f- I throwed up. I throwed up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I throwed up. And they don't, kids are stupid because they don't know to wipe the vomit off your chin. <laughs> it's just all over them. I throwed up. <laughs> yeah, I see that. Did you get any on the floor? Uh, From the looks of it, you didn't get any on the floor or the toilet. <laughs> yeah, just that angry drive to work after being woken from woken up that morning, 15 minutes early to go put a house fire and save the family. Like, you know, you're just like driving to work. Just, I'm going to swerve this into a fucking tree. But unfortunately, you're... In a horse carriage, so it's just... (laughs) No sense of urgency. You hit the tree at maybe seven miles an hour. (laughs) Just twist your horse's ankle. (laughs) Michael and William, they get up to throw on some clothes and begin the run to the Guinness farm as well. By the time they get there, Joe Maxson is just standing in the front yard with teenager William Clifford watching it burn. They can't do anything. Humphrey immediately asks Max and, you know, her farm, Belle's farmhand, she says, he says, where do they sleep? What window was their bedroom windows? And that's when Joe points to the two bedroom windows on the second floor. Fortunately, they saw that those two windows were part of the house where the roof hadn't actually caved in yet. And maybe there was hope. Oh. So Humphrey picked up a few bricks that he found laying around and began flinging them at the window, and one by one he broke those windows out. Unfortunately, the second those windows broke from the bricks, flames came spitting out, and nobody responded. Backdraft. Despite the fact that clearly, if anybody's in this room, they're probably not alive, Humphrey and Joe Maxson run to a shed and get a ladder. They return, set the ladder up from the ground up to the bottom of that second floor window, And Humphrey begins climbing the ladder so he can look through each of the windows. He gets to the children. He goes to the children's rooms first. When he looks through the window, he sees that not only are the beds empty, there's nobody in the beds. There's nobody in the room. So there's no bodies. He doesn't see any bodies. Furthermore, the flames from the first story had already eaten a hole in the center of the bedroom floor. And flames were coming from the floor of the first story to the ceiling of the second story. 
It's interesting that he, no one was like, which were rich rooms, bells, where's bell at? Well, that comes next. Oh, he climbs back down the ladder and then they move the ladder to the room next to the kids. Second floor window climbs back up the ladder. Same thing up. No sign of bell whatsoever. She's not in her bed, not in the floor, nowhere to be found. Just fire in an empty bed. Mysterious. Yeah. This is important, I think. Okay. All right. Humphrey, climb back down the ladder. Usually when somebody says this is important, there's a rejoinder of information. Like, because you're on a roll. We'll get to it later when it comes to conspiracy theories. Okay. All right. Start talking about, you know, pictures that we have of Belle Gunness holding her fingers like this. Be quiet. You, uh, Um, I don't know. The Illuminati signs. I don't know that she was part of the Illuminati yet. Jury's still out. Humphrey orders Michael Clifford, his brother, to run to their other neighbor's house, a man by the name of Daniel Hudson, and wake him up. Now, why we need to get all of the neighbors involved in this, I don't know. But he does. Daniel Hudson is woken up by banging at his front door, and when he answers it, there's an out-of-breath Michael Clifford standing there. When he swung the door open, Michael yelled at him, quote, Are you going to let your neighbors all burn up while you sleep? (laughs) And honestly, at at like four in the morning, I'm going to have to think about the answer to this question. Yeah, exactly. I might. have to process for a moment. (laughs) First off, I'm not an asshole for sleeping at four in the morning. Yeah. What are you, crazy? Where are your priorities? Second off, I don't know if you heard, I was asleep. I don't have a detector in my house that alerts me when the neighbor's house is on fire that I'm ignoring. Also certain a set of skills. It's it's uh, presumptive to think that just because you're a neighbor that you could do anything. <laughs> you know? Especially not. since most of the roof has already caved in and the house is now completely engulfed in flames. Yeah, like what are you supposed to do? Yeah. Thanks for making me feel better. I mean, I can accomplish just as much right here in my kitchen watching through the window. <laughs> Daniel Hudson, however, apparently doesn't think like us because he, once again, didn't even tie his shoes and soon joined the others over there in the front yard of the Gunnis house. And they realize, nope, even with this other neighbor here, <laughs> there's still nothing we can do. Uh... That's when Daniel Hudson... Tells Joe Maxson, who is the youngest of all of them, this young farmhand of Bell's. He says, hey, go get the horses out of the uh, horse barn there, tie them up to a carriage, and then go into town and tell Sheriff Smutzer what's going on here. Joe Maxson arrives in town at 5 a.m., just an hour after the fire started. Quickly stops the carriage, the horse and carriage there at the jail, and runs inside to find Deputy Sheriff William Antis sitting at his desk. After quickly filling in Officer Antis on the situation, the two of them make their way over to Sheriff Smutzer's house, and then Joe Maxson and Deputy Antis follow behind Sheriff Smutzer in his new red Ford Roadster. And I'll talk more about this little Roadster here in a minute. So the sheriff is riding in his red Ford Roadster. Joe Maxson and the deputy are riding behind the Roadster in a horse and carriage. By the time they all arrive, Only three walls of the Gunnis house were still standing. The rest of the house was almost completely to the ground. And once again, even with these two other men, all they could do was watch. Uh, But I'll bet you they got a tongue lashing for just not getting involved. Yeah. (laughs) By daybreak, the fire at the Gunnis house had burned itself out. And by that time, over 50 spectators had joined them. Most of the people there did start taking shifts, running pails of water from the nearby Clear Lake, doing what they could. Now, this lake was right across the road. It's still there to this day if you go to the address. And I don't remember the address. I told you that address in part two of Bell Gunness. But I do know that the lake is right across the road from that address still to this day. They were taking shifts, running pails of water, Uh, from that lake and putting out what little they could of the fire and embers. By noon that day, 
A dozen men were in the in the rubble, digging with rubble with picks and shovels, looking for the Gunnis family, their their bodies. At three forty five PM, several hours into searching, William Humphrey, and that's the same man that had climbed the ladder to try and save the kids, is digging in the rubble on the southeast corner of what is left of the house when his shovel tip hit something soft. It was Bell Gunnis' clitoris. <laughs> yeah, stop it. Right now. Ah, I'm not kidding. He says, hey, I hit something soft over here. And the rest of the men that were digging there, they join him. And within minutes, they uncover the entire Gunnis family. All of them. The three children and Bell. They were all charred black. The children had had a quilt thrown on, over them making it look as if Bell had tried to protect them either from, I don't know, maybe the flames or or trying to get them, knowing that it would be chilly if, when they got out of the house. They had, a, they had a quilt over them. There's several reasons why you would throw a quilt over some kids, though. Well, well didn't, didn't they go, like, she could have just thrown the quilt on them to go to bed. Like, good night, here's a quilt. Well, they weren't located in their rooms, if you remember. Oh, yeah, that's right. Maybe they they, they were all together on a, on a bottom part of the house. Okay. Little four-year-old Philip Gunnis, the youngest of the children, was the least burned of all the bodies. Even he, though, his legs were completely burned off at the knees. And his face was charred black. And his mouth was locked open in a scream. Interestingly, they also found a hole in his head which was, at that point in time, chalked up to just being done by a falling brick and that it was probably already dead when that had happened. More interesting, possibly most interesting op, the most badly burned body out of all of them was Bell Gunnis's, which was also missing its head. Oh. Didn't have a head. No head. <laughs> That's not common in... House fires. Not very common at all. No. Now, in 1908, we just chalked it up to, guess the fire burned it off. <laughs> at the autopsy, later that day, something else was discovered. The quote-unquote body of Bell Gunnis, after they uh, measured it and everything, five foot two. Five inches shorter than Bell Gunnis was, and also weighed about half the weight of Bell Gunnis. That's like me picking the corpse of Idris Elba <laughs> and then leaving it in this house when I burn it down. Also, shocking, this body that they found char charred, normal-sized clit. <laughs> Gosh, dang it. Uh, just when the spirit starts coming back. I, I, I like to hit you with the left hook. They never found the skull, the skull of quote unquote Bell Gunnis' body. And like I said, they just figured it had burned off in the fire. <laughs> that is the dumbest assumption. That, it well, may... it is stupid, yes. <sighs> but to be fair, I mean, they look at this kid, you know, little... Little Philip Gunnis, his his legs are burned off. Like, oh, maybe it'll happen to a head, too. Just burned her head off. At 5 p.m. up, Ray Lamphere is brought in for questioning. Yeah, boy. When asked about his whereabouts that morning, where have you been last night and this morning? At first, he was dodgy, and then he changed his story. And there's a reason he changed his story. He had been sleeping with a woman... Ray Lamphere had by the name of Elizabeth Smith. Now, if you're wondering why that was spicy in the in 1908, Elizabeth Smith was a black woman. Uh oh. And was the daughter of Virginia slaves who had migrated to Indiana after the Civil War. Uh oh. So they hear he's sleeping with a black lady, and it's like, oh, this guy would definitely kill an entire family in a house fire. Now, in her younger years. Elizabeth Smith was called, quote, the handsomest black girl in Indiana. Hmm. 
And also, uh, according to rumors, she had, in her early years, really thrown that ass down on some white. Mm. And this makes me giggle. Uh, just the idea of some, like, backwoods, Indiana, white country boy in the late 1800s seeing a black girl for the first time and then her just absolutely laying it fucking on him. Just... Really pouring it on him. I bet that boy, that young fellow, was never racist the rest of his life. Because <laughs> uh, I don't know if you've seen video, video, but those black ladies will leave bruising around your pelvis. I've, I don't, haven't seen that. They be fucking. <laughs> uh. And the idea of this just little white Christian boy in 1880 just being rode like a fucking rodeo bull and being like, I was wrong about everything that I thought about black people. (laughs) (laughs) Anyways, according to the newspapers, that had been when Elizabeth Smith was young. This this daughter of slaves. She was a, a, a real looker. In her young years. This was not 1908, though. And in 1908, when Ray Lanfear is sleeping with her, she's 72 years old. And she had not aged well. Mm. Uh, apparently, black in this case did crack. Is that a phrase? Is that actually a thing? But black, don't black don't crack? crack? Yeah, they say black people age as well. And I think in most cases, they really do. I Look at Morgan Freeman. That man's 190 years old, still looks great. Yeah. But there are rare cases, apparently like this with Elizabeth Smith, where black does absolutely crack. And she was one of them because the white kids around the neighborhood thought that she was a literal witch and ran past her house in terror. That's how scary she was. Yikes. Ray Lamphere didn't mind, though. and. Ray Lamphere's story was backed up by Elizabeth Smith, who they brought in next for interview. Um, According to Elizabeth Smith, Ray Ray had indeed showed up at her house on Monday night, hours before the fire. And uh, I have a quote here from Elizabeth Smith. Now, Jess, I'm not a lady, so I'm going to need you to read this next part. I need you to do the voice, if you can, of a early 20th century black woman who was the daughter of slaves. Um, uh, please be respectful. Have a little class for fuck's sakes. Don't make this racist. I just really, I really, really need you to sound like an early 20th century black woman who was the daughter of slaves. Please, whenever you do this, please just do your best impression. I really want, when they hear you talking, I want them to go, she's really that white lady, that very white lady, really sounds like she's doing an impression a very stereotypical impression of a 20th century black woman who was the daughter of slaves. Thousands upon thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people are going to listen to this. No pressure. Please stay classy. (sighs) Anyways, Jess, here's the quote for you. Jess, come on. No, thanks. (laughs) Can you make it... Just do like a small boy from Britain... Who turns no. into an Asian man. You call me in for, like, the typical white girl fitting. I, I'm not. Okay. Okay. Hold on a minute. So what I'm going to do at this moment, and I'm really going to do this, is I'm going to research the, old, the, the oldest recordings that we have of a southern black lady talking. In the edit, I'll put in 10 minutes later or whatever, and I'm going to try to do my best impression of a uh, early 1900s black lady that's the daughter of slaves talking, okay. and I'll try to keep it accurate. Okay. Okay. This isn't in my job description. So. A few moments later. Okay, I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> you missed Kent. You missed her reading it, Kent. <laughs> Ray said he was sick and he had no money. Exactly. She sounded like <laughs> she sounded like Lionel Richie's daughter. <laughs> okay, I'm back. And I don't know what I was expecting to hear. <laughs> Me neither. But I closed my eyes and it really they don't sound any different than old white ladies in the 
early 1900s and 1800s, which I guess makes sense if you, uh, they don't sound any different. There's not anything that I could pick on that would be edgy <laughs> to, to read this with. So I'm just going to read it because I don't, I, I don't have a good impression um, unless Jess wants to do one, but I know what Jess would do and it would get us in trouble. She just sound like Cat Williams. <laughs> KK Cat Williams. Uh, so this is what Elizabeth Smith, Elizabeth Smith said when asked to back up Ray's story. She said, quote, Ray said he was sick and he had no money. I'm kidding. <laughs> I like the shoulder dance you were doing. Do, 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 boo, boo, head swivel, swivel. <laughs> okay, quote. Okay. Ray said he was sick and he had no money. If I ever get any money, I'll pay you. He told me, and then he sat down a while. He fell asleep in the chair and slept about half an hour. Then he woke up and said, are you going to let me have the room? I told him I thought so, and then he went over to the saloon and got something to eat. I had my clock set for 4.30, and he turned it back to 3.30. I heard the alarm go off and went in to wake him up. He was snoring like a good fellow, and I told him it was after 4 o'clock. He said, quote, my God, I ought to be over to work at Wheatbrooks by this time. And then he started out. I didn't see him after he left my house until this morning, but I can sure say, though, that he was at my house at four o'clock that morning, unquote. Why are all the people up? That's I don't understand that. There's so many it's people. It's fucking the early 1900. What do you mean? People didn't always sleep until one thirty in the afternoon. It's just, it just seems so early to be starting to do anything. Yeah, but I mean, it got... In these days, when the sun went down, you went to bed. And that's if it was at 6 o'clock or 9 o'clock. And then you got up before the sun to eat breakfast because you actually had to go, like, work a farm. Yeah, work in a mill. Not to mention everything took three times as long because of, you know, we have modern technology now. Yeah. You couldn't just throw a... A hungry man dinner in the microwave and... Also travel. I guess travel was slow, too. Travel was slow, yeah. I take it back. Steering this bitch into a tree. (laughs) Fuck. (laughs) Not as easy. The point of all this is that this is somebody that has nothing to gain from this saying, hey, he was at my house when this fire started. She said it was after four o'clock when she woke Ray up. And you got to keep in mind that even if he sprinted from her house to however far it was from Gunnis's, he does everything on foot. There's no way Ray Ray Lanfear could have done this. On May 1st, 1908, Andrew Helgian's brother... Azel, if you remember, Azel the Bloodhound, sees in the paper that Bell Gunness' farm has burned down in LaPorte, Indiana. On the very next day, the 2nd of May, he gets on a train and starts making his way down there. I've got to really give all the credit to Azel. Like, this guy is relentless. He's got a good gut. Yeah. And honestly, without the pressure from him, there may have been countless other men dead because i think the reason that this happened was pressure yeah i agree azel helgelian arrives in laporte indiana on sunday may 3rd 1908 just two days after seeing it in the paper by train he spends that first night at the tea garden house hotel at the intersection of monroe street and lincoln way that hotel has since been torn down and is now a smoothie joint the next morning He gets up and makes his way over to the office of the Laporta Herald, the newspaper joint, and he buys back issues of all the daily papers so that he can get completely caught up on the details of the house fire. After leaving there, he goes over to the sheriff's office and introduces himself to Sheriff Smutzer. He tells the sheriff about his brother going missing and how he suspected Bell Gunnis had something to do with it. And that's when Sheriff Smutzer says, hey, get in my little red Ford Roadster. I don't know if you've seen it. 
parked out front there. That's my car. I have a car. Everybody else has a horse and carriage. I've got that red Ford Roadster. And the two of them drive out to the Gunnis farm. Now, when they get there, they find that only two men are still in the rubble. Still looking for Bell's head, by the way. Those two men were Joe Maxson, who was Bell's farmhand, and uh, Bell's neighbor, Daniel Hudson. So they get there in that sheriff's red little roadster that sheriff was super proud of. <laughs> I don't know how anybody could be proud of one of these cars. You ever heard one run? It's always like... <laughs> it's chitty, chitty, bang, bang. <laughs> It'd be hard to look at another man over that noise and be like, Huh? Huh? Right? Huh? Pretty badass. Nice, huh? Hair's all fucked up because it doesn't have a top. (laughs) Huh? I guess it does beat. Just slightly, but yes, you're right. Azel Helgelian hops out of that little Fred Ford Roadster and immediately begins helping dig in the rubble. But he's looking for something that maybe would lead to his brother. He doesn't give a fuck about Bell Gunness' head. He digs all day, doesn't find anything, and that night he stays in the house of the Nicholson family next door when they offer him a bed to sleep in until the next morning. Early that next morning, on May 5th, 1908, all of Bell Gunness's crimes will come to light. Hazel returns to the farm to continue searching. Now, while Daniel and Joe, they continue digging in the ruins there, looking for the head, Hazel takes a walk around the farm and starts looking for anything suspicious. At first, he finds nothing. And then he returns to Joe Maxson and he says, Hey, Joe, you recall there ever being like a hole dug around here, a large hole Like, maybe you spotted some soft dirt where a hole had been. Like, anything like that. And Joe Maxson tells Azel, Hey, actually, that that does ring a bell. Back in spring, I helped Bell throw a bunch of rubbish in a large hole that had been dug in the hog pen. And actually, a few days after that, Bell made me fill it up. So Azel says, Well, show me where that hole was. And then the three men, they begin digging right there in the hog pen where that hole was. Within minutes, the smell of decay started filling the air, and four feet down, one of the men hits a burlap sack. And through a tear in the fabric of that burlap sack, they could see a man's neck as well as a severed arm. They had discovered a body. Within an hour, the sheriff and the coroner were both there. That body was dug up, lifted out of the grave in the large sack, and then spread out on the ground beside the hole. The corpse had been chopped up. The torso's arms had been cut off at the shoulders, the legs at the knees, and the head had also been removed, but it was intact. On the right arm, there were defensive wounds, deep gashes on the forearm, as well as all of the fingers of that hand had been chopped off. It appeared that whoever had attacked this person had attacked them with a large bladed weapon and in the process of trying to stop the blows had gotten his fingers cut completely off. Then the head was pulled from the sack up and that's when Azel Helgelian unfortunately was able to identify the body immediately. Though badly decomposed, he knew for a fact that he was staring at his brother's decapitated head. Despite the fact that God knows how many bodies were buried on this property. And you'll see just how many are around how many by the end of this story. The one body that Azel himself had found was, in fact, his brother. The chances of this were astronomical. It's kind of crazy to think about. By the end of that first day of digging at various spots around the farm, four more bodies were unearthed. Two men, one woman, one female adolescent, and all of them were divided into six pieces. They were all in burlap sacks. Their arms and legs and head had been removed. And oftentimes these sacks contained several pieces from different corpses. It was just kind of a grab sack of different pieces of people. On the young female adolescent corpse that they found this day, Coroner Charles Mack would later say, quote, 
With the exception of the uterus, some of the viscera could be recognized. The right arm was severed by a chopping instrument an inch below the head of the humerus. Both arms were detached from the body. The two femoral were cut off through the lower third. There were found four arms and four forearms with hands with the body, but it is impossible to say which, if any, belonged to this body. There were found two skulls and two lower maxillary bones with this body, but it is impossible to say which, if any, belonged to this body. There were also two sets of fibula, but they could not be positively identified as belonging to this body. From the examination, it is impossible to determine the cause of death. Unquote. They were, however, able to figure out the identity of that young woman that they buried, that they dug up on that first day. Who do you think it was up? Young woman on the first day. I'm going to go with, uh, I kind of want to go Pirates of the Caribbean type of thing where it's like, I'm not the real pirate. I, or I that pirate died a long time ago, and I'm the new Belganess, and that was the original. Like, I want to make some cool story up, but I'm kind of feeling right. like it's probably more bit down to earth, like Bell's daughter. It is down to earth, way down there in the earth, <laughs> four Dang. foot down. That was the body of Jenny Olson, Bell's daughter, who was supposedly in California, her own daughter that she had raised from literally an infant. 16 years old, she had raised this kid, chopped up into several pieces, and just thrown in a hole with a bunch of other men. I thought... Between May 6th... What? I thought she was in California. She wasn't, it turns out. If that was a twist to you, I would have loved to have seen you see the end of Sixth Sense. (laughs) I bet your fucking head exploded. (laughs) I just picture that gif of Forrest Gump running out of the front of his house and down the road. I have a I have a I have a family member who is the dudest dude beard hunter, but when you watch him watch a Disney movie, it almost makes you cry because of the sense of wonder on his face. Like he just can't <laughs> hold it in. He is so engrossed whenever he watches like a just, a, and he laughs at at everything that's just mildly funny. But he's genuine. It's. Like, That's how I'm kind of that way with this story. I did not see that coming. (laughs) So through May 6th through the 29th, investigators continue digging up bodies on the Gunnis farm. They dug up so many bodies that the buggy shed there on the farm was turned into a makeshift morgue while victims were pulled from the ground one by one, piece by piece. Every single one of them were badly decomposed and all of them had had quicklime scattered on them before being buried. So many bodies and so many pieces of bodies were pulled from different digs on the Gunnis farm that investigators literally stopped counting. Newspapers say they stopped counting at 40. Oof. Spectators also came from all over to watch the police dig. The Gunnis farm was packed with people from all over Indiana and surrounding states. Keep in mind, this is before Netflix. You didn't have forensic files or true crime podcast. True crime addicts then had to get their feet on the ground. We've really gotten spoiled. We really have. We've, we've gotten lazy. There were so many people on the Gunnis farm that wanted to get, a, get that were rubbernecking, trying to get inside of a dead body. That there were vendors there selling cakes and ice cream. Could you imagine the hosts of Crime Junkie just slogging around on a farm to get answers? I can. They'd be following some other podcast troupe who's getting the answers, and then they would just take them. <laughs> Guys, Zing. it's 35 degrees outside, full body chills. Full body chills. Good thing I wore my Hunter rubber boots. Hunter And the boots. sweater that says, coffee, hell fucking yeah. <laughs> it's coffee time, bitches. That's what the back says. And you can get these on my Etsy store. <laughs> they would just stay warm and wait for other podcasters to do the work. Then they'd be like, let's trade notes. Let's trade notes. What'd you guys find? And then uh, she would just say what the other people found word for word verbatim. <laughs> November 26, 1908. 
Crime Junkie, that is Ashley Flowers, right? Okay. Yeah. I'd like to, to make say sure I don't, I don't know. I'm on the right person. <laughs> November 26, 1908, poor ass Ray Lamphere is charged with the murder of Belle Gonis and her three children, as well as the murder of Andrew Helgelian, as well as arson, despite all of the testimonies proving otherwise. Fortunately, he was acquitted of the murders, but somehow was charged with the arson. What? Which doesn't make sense now or then. Not at all. For the arson... Ray Lamphere was sentenced to two years in prison, but unfortunately died shortly afterwards of tuberculosis, right after his sentencing in prison of tuberculosis. So, of course, that brings us to the end of the Bell Gunna story. That's where the concrete facts end. The big question off is, what happened to Bell Gunnis? Is she dead? She, of course, is dead now. She's been dead for a long time, even if she didn't die that night on the house fire, that night in the house fire. But did she die that night in the house fire? Well, no. I personally believe that she either stole a corpse or created one. That's, well, creating a corpse, that's called murder. Just creating it. Creating a corpse is murder. If there was a recipe online for making a corpse, the first step would be murder. After you have to read about the author of the recipes, childhood summer spent at Nana's College. <laughs> Long story short, we don't know exactly. Still to this day, 2024, we're recording this in February of 2024. We don't know. We do know that in the months following the Bell Gunnis house fire, there were reported sightings of Bell Gunnis all over the United States. From Colorado to Mississippi to New York City to California, Chicago, all the way up to Canada. People claim seeing Bell Gunnis in all these places. I'm curious as to what you think happened up. Well, I I kind of feel like somebody like her, I don't know that she could stop doing what she was doing. So okay. I, my gut says that... We just don't have it tabulated as a dot that was connected. But somewhere else in the world, there was a rash of crimes, murders, disappearings. That was Bell doing it again. So I'm glad you brought that up. That's a good good thing to bring up. We are, of course, at the end of our story. But I will say that over the up until 1951. <clears throat> there were crimes in surrounding areas that they suspected may have been Bell Gunnis. And that brings us to a lady by the name of Esther Carlson. Now, Esther Carlson is a huge percentage of probably 30 uh, percent of Harold Schechter's book on Bell Gunnis, which we used for the research in this series. Mm hmm. And I don't want to go over her whole story. I'm just going to I'm just going to sum it up here real quickly. She Esther Carlson did some crimes. And on her deathbed, she was guilty of some poisonings. And on her deathbed, people started accusing her of being Bell Gunnis. She denied it until her dying breath. And everybody talks about the reason I'm not talking about a lot a lot about Esther Carlson in this series. I know the guys on last podcast on the left did. If you want to hear more about Esther Carlson, you can go listen to their series. I'm not going to cover it because I personally don't believe that Esther Carlson was Bell Gunnis. If you look at people say about how much they looked alike, it, that could not be further from the truth. Pull up a picture of picture of Bell Gunnis and a picture of Esther Carlson. They literally look nothing alike. Yeah. Esther Carlson is is very frail and small. Bell Gunnis looked like uh, Deion Sanders. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's a stretch to think uh, that they could possibly be the same person. Oh, gosh, yeah, no. And people would, you know, argue, well, you know, by the time Esther died, she was an old lady and she was frail and she was sick and she had lost weight. Okay, I'll give you, I'll extend that olive branch, but there's one very distinctive thing that you'll notice about Esther Carlson is that she has a large mole on her left cheek right below her eye, which is very clearly not there on Belle Gunness in any of her photos. Yeah, yeah. Nobody ever talks about that. It makes you... Uh, because I think it makes the story more kind of... Uh, provocative. It's weird that 
when it comes to research for something like this, that, I mean, the, 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 the term confirmation bias is played out, but even in research, it's weird how people can overlook such stark contrasts in what seem like fact or even visual confirmation of things and overlook yes. it and be like, no, oh, still going to think these two people are the same. Could have photoshopped it back in 1908. We never know. You yeah. don't know. <laughs> no. Yeah. And the way you had to photoshop things in 1908 was the same way they made the pilot episode of South Park. <laughs> you just had to cut it out. There was like literal work. Yeah. Uh, another reason that I think Esther Carlson isn't Belle Gunn S, and I don't know why nobody thought of this. Uh, I may have cracked this case wide open. I don't know. Surely this has been done by somebody else. I backtracked Esther Carlson. We have a beautiful tool now called newspapers.com. Yeah, right. And I found Esther Carlson existing at the same time that Belle Gunnis was alive. Evidence of her existence. I found evidence. Esther Carlson gave her full backstory, who, the men she were married to, um, everything, and all of it, I fact-checked it. All of it adds up, and a lot of her story is happening simultaneously while Belle Gunnis is doing her thing. These are very clearly two different people. Yeah. Yeah. Very hopeful on the part of some people that are trying to maybe just peddle some breaking, you heard it here first, folks, kind of. Exactly. So unless Bel Gunnis was living a double life as what would soon be her alias, Esther Carlson, <laughs> and doing the Mrs. Doubtfire thing, uh, where she's having to run to the bathroom and have two dinners at once. Oh, hello! Also, you what, know. Was, what was the geographic different distance between these two? So Esther Carlson lived most of her life in fucking Connecticut. Yeah. No way. No possible Which way. Which is a long way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know how many click clocks you have to listen to to get from Connecticut to Indiana? <laughs> That's impossible. Yeah, it's like almost halfway across the fucking United States. <laughs> Plus you got to get through the, the like Nazi salute part of the United States, that little... Right. You know, ah, Hitler <laughs> thing, part of the country where that little salute thing. Yeah. Um, and then you got to go down across the northern part of the United States to get to Indiana. It's a long way. Yes. Yeah, and I found evidence in newspapers.com of these two people existing at the same time. Yeah. So, you know, they say, how do you know so-and-so isn't Batman? We've never seen them in the same room together. I have seen these two exist at the same time together. <laughs> you know, <laughs> It's proof. It's in the old newspapers. Yeah. Thank heavens for the articles, you know, the newspapers, because they, they prove out a lot of this kind of stuff. Yes, which we didn't have access to in this time. So I can understand people getting wrapped around this axle at this time. You know? Right. So I, I, I would go out on one more limb. I would say that I feel like there may be a chance that she left the United States. and ended I believe up that. Either went went somewhere back, you know, back Norwegian, you know, fi kind of somewhere fami f relatively familiar or felt like culturally, you know, in line. And she just started doing the same thing. But I, I can't imagine she was like, well, had a good run. I'm just going to hang it up. She just she seemed so narcissistic and like hell bent on doing exactly this thing. I can't. Im I think she did it till she died. I agree with you a thousand percent. I do believe that Belle Gunnis did that fire herself, killed her children, and then obtained a corpse somehow and staged her own death and fled the country and probably died of old age somewhere in Norway. Yeah. The last little bit of, st of, of story here on Belle Gunnis. In 2008, they dug up the corpse of what we thought was Bell Gunnis. The headless burned what was left of it. you got to keep in mind it had been in the ground at this point, literally 100 years. She died in 1908. They dug her up in 2008, 100 years, to try to do DNA testing on this corpse to see if it was Bell Gunnis. Results came back inconclusive. Inconclusive. Ugh. 
the DNA wasn't strong enough to be able to say for sure yes or no. Huh. And that's kind of where this story closes, because unless we get better DNA testing, we will never know the answer to this story. Yeah. I do firmly believe that Ray Lamphere is innocent, though, was innocent. I mean, there's proof of Bell trying to set him up weeks in advance before this fire. I wonder something. So let's see. Let me see. Let me see. Did she ever, she never cranked out her own kid, did she? Yes. She had, no, no. It wasn't her kid. Right. There's Philip, Philip Gunnis, which people would, she claims that she had, but if you remember, there were even like, there was, that was shady even then. Yeah. Cause so what I was, no, we don't know for a fact that she ever had a biological child. Okay. I was going to say, you know, if, if there was suspicion of it nowadays, you could do a familial DNA and see if anybody traces back, you know, we could, at some point, if we found somebody that they're like, no, I'm pretty sure my mom or my grandma was Belganess, we could do familial DNA and see. But then again, you know, the know only like. The only trace of Bell Gunnis that we know for sure was Bell Gunnis that was found in that fire was a tooth with some dental work done to it. Uh, and it's ironic that the tooth that, that they found was one that could be identified by a dentist as belonging to Dale Gunnis. He said, yes, that's my work, and that is Bell Gunnis' tooth. Uh, but if I was, if, if me not going to prison for the rest of my life or being hanged was. Uh, on the on the line, I would have no problem getting one of my teeth out. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. And that's kind of unfortunately that's where this story ends. And uh, sadly, I personally don't believe we will ever have an answer, ever. Yeah, it'd be it'd be hard. It'd be hard. the The only thing is, if the story were to come across, if she, if she did, if she did stay alive and she went somewhere, and and this story ends up in the ears of somebody, we're like, you know what? Around the time that she was disappeared there, these things started happening here. And somebody was like, well, yeah, and I kind of, I lived there and I kind of feel like maybe my mom or grandma was that person. I mean, that kind of scenario could come up. That's how we've caught other serial killers, you know. Yes. But to your point, there the, the trail goes cold until until somebody starts connecting some dots somewhere else. And maybe, you know, maybe she ran off to wherever she went and was able to control those urges and just married some dude and died of old age. Jesse shaking her head no, so that didn't happen. She probably wreaked havoc wherever she ended up, but I think that was probably in another country. We can all agree to that. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Because this was national headlines. I mean, if you search the old newspaper.com articles, you'll find Bell Gunness stories when this was going on all over the United States. Yeah. So that's the story of Bell Gunnis. And for now, the book just stays open. Yeah. Well, if anyone is tired of hearing me just go, wow, yeah, insert coin fact here. You can find. Yeah, that's the coin facts for me, man. Full blown just... episodes of just Kent Chungus all on his own in TCK case files. All you have to do is go to patreon.com forward slash 1159 media. And soak in the goodness of just hearing Kent without hearing my annoying ass trying to be relevant on a show. You can also go to 1159plus.com and find TCK case files there. I have been saying it for a long time. Kent is a flower that doesn't need another flower next to it to bloom. And no, and he's like, ah, ah, blah, blah, blah. And he's just, I don't know if he's being kind or he, you know, he knows I'm. I don't know what's going on, but check out TCK Case Files and then and, and tell us in the comments if you think that is a better use of Kent's time. <laughs> I look at TCK Case Files as a lifeboat. <laughs> <laughs> a very good lifeboat. You know, the funny thing, here's the funny thing, here's the funny thing, is it's a lifeboat like... If TCK, if True Crime Kent, because with us both being on the show, is a boat, and then somebody's like, hey, there should be a lifeboat for this one. And then they built a boat that was better. <laughs> <laughs> then the yeah, boat. It's like, <laughs> if the lifeboat on a Titanic, the lifeboat of that lifeboat was just the Titanic. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> just another one of it. But but like sh- but it 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 sailed better because it was one crewman lighter. <laughs> <laughs> let's get off of this dinghy. It's sinking onto this cruise ship. Let's just get a. Let's get rid of that. Just one guy, and we'll be fine. Ah, oh, look, it floats just fine now. Yay! <laughs> anyway, Patreon.com forward slash eleven fifty nine media. Check out. I just want you to know, Op, that I would move my big fat ass over on that door, floating <laughs> up there in that cold, rigid water when there's clearly room. For multiple people, not just one, and let you get out of that cold water onto that floating door with me. If if it were you and I redoing that scene, you would be like, don't try to drown yourself. And I'm like, let go of my hand. Let go of my hand. The water's fine. Just let go. Uh, You'd be uh, checking the bodies, the pockets of the bodies for coins. <laughs> There's so much more I could have done if you just let go of my Look, this one's a 1912 penny. I'm like, it's 1912, you fucking idiot. It's not worth anything yet. It's today's penny. Oh, man. Anyway, I'm very, I'm excited for TCKK's Files. I think it's a great, a great show. So, again, um, yeah, support Kent. Okay. Patreon. 1159 plus. Are we done? We're done. Well, that was Bell Gunness. Bye!